All throughout the literature of the ancient world, we see humans in dialogue with supernatural entities, gods, spirits, angels, and demons, who often speak to give advice, or even order the human characters around. We don't properly appreciate just how strange this is, and most people are content to write off these spiritual beings as a poetic device. But we need to ask why these occurrences are so ubiquitous. Did these civilizations invent these gods just to enrich their stories? Or do they have a different origin entirely? According to the psychologist Julian Jaynes, these gods were not merely fictional, as is often believed today, but actually had their origins in the nervous system of early humans. In fact, the reason why so many early stories contain people having conversations with gods is because the gods were experienced as hallucinatory voices, originating from the right hemisphere of the brain. These voices revealed information to the person, using language to condense this information into a message which can then change the person's behavior in response to a novel stimuli. Eventually, and for reasons which are not totally clear, this mentality was gradually replaced by what we call consciousness, where instead of obeying the gods, we obey our ego, which has taken on the function of volition, i.e. instructing our behavior. The vestigial remnants of this archaic psychology still exist today in the modern world, in the form of those who suffer from schizophrenia. Schizophrenia, which literally means splitting of the mind, is a mental disorder which currently affects between 0.3 and 0.7% of the world population. The main symptoms of schizophrenia include having delusions, catatonic behavior, disorganized thinking, and experiencing hallucinations, both auditory and visual. It is unknown what causes the syndrome, but one commonly believed idea is that it has to do with an excess of dopamine in the brain, since drugs that block dopamine can be used as a treatment, although it is worth noting that this does not always work. Schizophrenia is also known to be genetically linked, meaning that you are more likely to acquire the disease if you have family members who also have schizophrenia. People with schizophrenia often have great difficulties in their social and professional lives, and as a result, have a higher rate of suicide. But is it possible that this disease, which is considered dysfunctional in today's egoistic world, may have evolved as an evolutionary advantage during the dawn of civilization? This was James's hypothesis, and he believed that schizophrenia isn't just a dysfunctional psychological disorder, but is actually a vestige of a previous mentality which predominated before 1000 BC, in which people believed they were being spoken to directly by gods. Many of the symptoms of schizophrenia point to this fact. The first and most obvious are the auditory hallucinations. Why are they present, asks Jaynes, and why is hearing voices universal throughout all cultures, unless there is some usually suppressed structure of the brain, which is activated in the stress of this illness? I find that the only notion, which provides even a working hypothesis about this matter, is that of the bicameral mind. That the neurological structure responsible for these hallucinations is neurologically bound to substrates for religious feelings, and this is because the source of religion, and of gods themselves, is in the bicameral mind. According to this theory, auditory hallucinations were evolved by natural selection as a mechanism of organizing human behavior in accordance with a common goal. People heard the voices of their gods, and used these directives to coordinate their activities, and perform what we might call non-instinctual behavior. In describing these voices, Jaynes writes the following. Usually they predominate, crowding in persistently and massively, making the patient appear confused, particularly when they are changing rapidly. In very acute cases, visual hallucinations accompany the voices. But in more ordinary cases, the patient hears a voice or many voices, a saint or a devil, a band of men under his window who want to catch him, burn him, behead him. They lie in wait for him, threaten to enter through the walls, climb up and hide under his bed, or above him in the ventilators. And then there are other voices who want to help him. Sometimes God is a protector, at other times one of the persecutors. At the persecuting voices, the patients may flee, defend themselves, or attack. With helpful, consoling hallucinations, the patient may listen intently, enjoy them like a festivity, 
even weeping at hearing the voices of heaven. These voices can be heard just as audibly as a real voice, and they frequently possess a commanding nature, compelling the schizophrenic to believe the voices, even if they give false information. As Jaynes writes, Now one of the most interesting and important aspects of all this, in respect to the parallel with the bicameral mind, is the following. Auditory hallucinations, in general, are not even slightly under the control of the individual himself, but they are extremely susceptible to even the most innocuous suggestion from the total social circumstances of which the individual is a part. Jaynes also observed that the voices often reflected what was absorbed by the person through their culture. In contemporary cultures, where an orthodox excessive personal relationship to God is a part of the child's education, individuals that become schizophrenic tend to hear strict religious hallucinations more than others. In other words, the voice in one's head tends to reflect the culturally imposed standards. This is why younger patients frequently have hallucinations involving their parents, since these were the first authoritative figures in the patient's life. One common delusion experienced by schizophrenics is the belief that they are being controlled by an outside influence, similar to how ancient humans believed they were under the control of their gods, which, in a psychological sense, was true. Sometimes, visual hallucinations also accompany these experiences, and can even involve hallucinations of divine figures. Religious hallucinations are particularly common in the so-called twilight states, which are a kind of waking dream in many patients, varying in time from a few minutes to a few years, six months duration being quite common. Such patients may even cry with joy at talking directly with the inhabitants of heaven, may continually cross themselves as they converse with the divine voices, or even with the stars, calling to them out of the night. Some patients begin to perceive the world and its elements differently, as though all were imbued with the divine. As one patient wrote, The sun came to have an extraordinary effect on me. It seemed to be charged with all power, not merely to symbolize God, but actually to be God. Phrases like, Light of the world, the sun of the righteousness that setteth nevermore, etc., ran through my head without ceasing, and the mere sight of the sun was sufficient greatly to intensify this manic excitement under which I was laboring. I was impelled to address the sun as a personal god, and to evolve from it a ritual sun worship. In one famous example, the German judge Daniel Paul Schreiber experienced multiple different voices, which he first believed to be gods, coming to him in the form of divine rays. The voices then arranged themselves in a hierarchy, almost like a pantheon of gods, and began to erode his sense of self, decoupling him from his ego. This erosion of the sense of self is also characteristic of the bicameral mind, in which humans had no ego, and it is also a common symptom of schizophrenia. This leaves them unable to think for themselves, or what Jaynes calls the erosion of the analog eye. The person's consciousness begins to fade away as the voices become more impelling and forceful, and they are reduced to a state of relative unconsciousness. This is associated with other symptoms, such as catatonia, in which the patient is rendered catatonic and has difficulty responding to stimuli appropriately, as well as avolition, which is when the patient is unable to direct their own behavior and what they do seems to be out of their control. This is likely how bicameral men experience the world, since their only directives would have been the hallucinatory voices of their gods, and they would have lacked the ability to use consciousness. With the loss of the analog eye, its mind space, and the ability to narratize, behavior is either responding to hallucinated directions, or continues on by habit. The remnant of the self feels like a commanded automaton, as if someone else were moving the body about. Even without hallucinated orders, a patient may have the feeling of being commanded in ways in which he must obey. This is a scary experience, and many of the difficulties people with schizophrenia have adjusting to life come from this feeling of ego death. This is because we in the modern world live as though each person possessed their own sense of self, but this is not how humans used to live. This lack of a sense of self also results in other symptoms, such as the inability to engage in as-if behavior. For instance, 
If asked to imagine what it would be like to be a fireman, a schizophrenic person might reply that they are not a fireman. Or asked to imagine that they have children, might reply, I don't have children. This is because they have no hypothetical ego, or analog eye, to imagine themselves in these scenarios. The hallucinations experienced can therefore take the place of consciousness, by thinking on behalf of the person. Gedenken Lautenwerden is a German word which describes the way in which these voices seem to say what the person was about to think, as though they were anticipating their thoughts, announcing the person's thoughts before they have even had a chance to think them. The voices are even able to read, and will sometimes read for the person ahead of their own inner voice. They will also occasionally narrate everything that is happening in a person's life. Sometimes they are loud and threatening, other times they are quiet and reassuring. One interesting thing Jane's notes is that hallucinations often seem to have access to more memories and knowledge than the patient himself, even as did the gods of antiquity. It is not uncommon to hear patients at certain stages of their illness complain that the voices express their thoughts before they have a chance to think them themselves. Another effect of schizophrenia is increased perceptivity. Consciousness constrains perception, painting the details into a single, easy-to-understand image. But without consciousness, what we experience is raw perception, allowing schizophrenics to take in details which we normally miss or ignore. But what does modern neuroscience say about this theory? According to Jaynes, these voices originate from the right hemisphere of the brain, and modern neuroscience has largely confirmed this idea. For example, a review conducted in 2005 found evidence for the idea that in schizophrenia, language functions that are normally exclusively found in the left hemisphere migrated to the right hemisphere, something predicted by the theory of the bicameral mind. Another study found that schizophrenia is associated with a failure of left hemispheric dominance for the phonological component of language, or in other words, the right hemisphere taking over some of the language functions which are normally found in the left hemisphere. These studies seem to point to the fact that the right hemisphere and its vestigial language centers being reactivated may be responsible for the auditory hallucinations which accompany schizophrenia. Although schizophrenia is considered a dysfunctional state of mind in the modern world, this was probably not the case in the past, when this state of mind would have been an enormous survival advantage, which would have put humans on the road to consciousness. People with schizophrenia are frequently ostracized and forced into the fringes of society for what we would regard as an abnormal state of mind. But what we need to remember is that consciousness emerged from this state of mind, and consciousness is by no means stable. Modern society prefers people with an ego-conscious mentality, and schizophrenics suffer trying to meet this standard by trying to force themselves into a conscious mentality, which often leads to dysfunction. Although it seems as though consciousness is superior, it is possible that in the future, human mentality will evolve again into something unrecognizable compared to consciousness, and what we call consciousness may be considered a mental illness. But this is just speculation. Please see the description of this video for more resources discussing schizophrenia and the bicameral mind.